Tonight's episode of Sign of the Times contains very sensitive material that may shock or offend our conservative viewers. Discretion is advised. What if you wake up one morning to find out that your life has changed in an instant, with a sudden turn for the worst? This is what happened to Mr. Gerald Chua, the subject of tonight's bizarre, disturbing episode. Is our civilization nearing its end? Let's find out tonight in Sign of the Times. I really don't understand how this happened. We had a very good life up until this point. Maybe bad luck really exists? I told him not to put a cactus inside the house. He really loves cactuses. Cacti, cacti. This is Mrs. Jennifer Chua, a regular Filipino-Chinese housewife who lives a very simple mundane life in Causeway Bay, Hong Kong. On the morning of April 31, 2032, Mrs. Chua witnessed her husband in a horrible state that would change their lives forever. I just woke up one morning to see that I already looked like this. Gerald, called Jerry by his friends and family, worked here as a corporate supervisor where he supervised his co-worker's work efficiency and filed a report about it at the end of the day. Gerald is truly our best supervisor, maybe the best supervisor we've ever had in the 35-year history of Villa. He has a very watchful eye he leaves no stone left unturned and has a very fine attention to detail. I never spoke to Gerald at all, but Mrs. Pangilinan filed glowing reports about him every day. So that day, I noticed Gerald not taking off his face mask while doing his work. So I called him up in the office and asked why so, and I was mortified by the sign of the hideous thing. So I told him to go home and sort it out, and not to come back until he fixes the situation. Unfortunately, Gerald completely forgot about his condition. Now Miss Fong, probably the most conservative lady in our company, passed by Gerald and he was greeted by the sign of his face with that hideous hair on her upper lip. Miss Pong went into a shock state. 
This whole thing caused a big freak out in the office. And he had to evacuate everyone and cease operation for the rest of the day. To this day, the unfortunate exposure has left an indelible scar in Miss Fung's psyche. That afternoon when he came home, his face told the whole story. Gerald Chua, an employee of Wheelock Paper Cups Distribution Limited for 18 years, was sent home that day and was asked to not go to work indefinitely. We tried everything we can. Scissors, cutter, razor blade, knives. Nothing worked. The fucking thing was hard. To delve deeper into this modern mystery, we turn to experts like we always do here in Sign of the Times, helping us unlock the complex nature of the centuries-old history of the mythical upper lip hair called the mustache by our ancestors. In my many years of teaching a class called History of Idiosyncrasies and Peculiarities in the Modern Age here in the Polytechnic University of Southeast Asia, I have never in my life imagined that I would experience something like this, something straight out of the history books. The outlawing of the male mustache started in 1776, when the queen then, Queen Georgia III, the British royal matriarch of the time, deemed the mustache as the cause of, what do you call that, female demonic hysteria. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church was very influential in the decision-making in that time of the British royalty. And we have enough documents here, yeah, proving that Pope Pius Joanne VI was on George's ear when the Queen decided to criminalize the mustache. And why was the mustache demonized? Well, 1776 was the beginning of the Georgian era's sexual awakening. And young women were beginning to explore their sexuality. And men who needed a quick buck were able to take advantage of this by repurposing hostels and to walk up brothels. And this was also the advent of organized crime. Uh, there are documents here we actually have some of the brothel's entrance tickets which prove that mustached boys or mustached prostitutes charged double, therefore became wealthier than non-mustached boys. Well, for our less educated viewers, can you please elaborate why that is so? Hmm, I don't know if you can understand this because you're male, but to our female viewers, Imagine a mound of hair softly brushing between your genitals. That must be very ticklish and pleasurable, I assume. And because the Roman Catholic Church was very influential at the time, uh, Pope Pius Joanne VI not only supported Queen George's edict to criminalize the male mustache, the Popes also made it an official part of church doctrine by including it as a cardinal sin in her amendment to the Catechism of the Catholic Church the following year. See, this development is also the main reason why polite society considers covering up our mouth area outdoors and in public. Treating it as like a private part of just like genitals. 20 years after the criminalization of the mustache, the Roman Catholic Church saw its irreparable demise in 1796 due to what was considered a viral scandal. 
when a mustached midget was discovered in Pope Pius Joanne VI's clerical closet. From its religious roots, how did male human beings eliminate the mustache from their evolution? And how, after many centuries, did it once again resurface in Gerald Chua's bizarre case? We will find out from one of the world's leading scientists. But first, Of course, I am worried and scared. I don't know what kinds of experiments they will carry out on me here. I don't know when we will see each other again. I think this case is a breakthrough and would be a welcome addition to the multiple courses on nature's evolutionary tattoos and biases, which I teach here at the Southeast Asian Poly U. When a male moustache was first criminalized by the British matriarchy, scientists of that era had already begun studying the manipulation of the moustachinary glands in males. Now we take for granted that male humans have evolved to not growing moustaches anymore. But before the discovery of the anti-moustache vaccine in 1875, people had no choice but to use an adhesive similar to today's duct tape to rip the moustaches of every male in society. As you see, the ancient method is practically useless in Mr. Chua's case. It seems like his cells have rebelled against human evolution. And the hair that grew in his mouth area has become indestructible. It has returned stronger than ever. Amazing. Most members of the public are in favor of ostracizing Gerald Chua from society. However, a very small minority see it differently. Why? Why not? Professor Samantha Lau and her team here at the Secret Science Facility are hoping to develop a stronger, more potent replication of the original 1875 anti-mustache vaccine. It is to be taken from Gerald Chua cells in case more of these evolutionary deviant cases pop up globally. However, for the study to be undertaken, Gerald Chua must remain cryogenically frozen. We had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Chua before he went into the freezing machine. I'm actually excited for this. I'll be writing a book about this and maybe become a motivational speaker when I wake up. Warning. Warning. Life systems failure. Warning. Warning. Life systems failure. Warning. Warning. Life systems failure. Warning. According to Professor Lau, it isn't clear when Gerald Chua will wake up again or if he will ever wake up at all. Next week, three decades after it was banned, vegetables are once again being considered to be sold for human consumption, creating an uproar in the poultry and livestock industry. 
Concerns arise as talks of releasing vegans from prison begin. I am William Elvin, and join us again next week for another deep dive into mysteries and anomalies here in Sign of the Times.